There's so much we don't know. Increase our understanding. Increase the knowledge that we need to have personally in our walk with you. Let us grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Let us look into eternity, into eternal things and realise it's just a short time on earth. We're like the grass that withereth away, here today and gone tomorrow, and we face eternity. We face the judgment of God that day when the world will be judged. So give us grace, we pray, and lead us by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We nearly re really need to get the book of Revelation together in our thoughts and in our hearts and in our minds. It's a most important book. And yet the church world does not understand that book by and large. You can guarantee just about every preacher has it all wrong. And that means just about every believer. Now I'm not saying that they don't have certain truths, they just haven't got it together right. And I'm not condemning them either. <laughs> I'm just a human being and just one of billions. But we need to recognise what we do know and what we don't know. We need to be willing to say, I've been wrong. We need to be willing to say, that's not really what the Word of God is saying. But we need to be able to stand upon the Word of God because if we get our own revelation, you can guarantee it's wrong. There's no such thing as our own revelation. The revelation's in the whole of the Word of God. And unfortunately, we have all been read in our churches with many lost books of the Bible. I venture to say that if our preachers and our people and we ourselves had diligently read the book of 1 Enoch from our youth up, the book of Jubilees from our youth up, all the lost books of the Bible from our youth up, we would never have entertained many of the end time views that are scattered around the globe. In fact, I dare say we would not have entertained any of the present beliefs that are generally uh, scattered throughout the, the churches of the world. So let's do our best to really ponder the book of Revelation. Think about it. And I would urge everybody to at least buy the books of 1 Enoch and the book of Jubilees and also the Ascension of Isaiah. And there are other books as well. But certainly those three to start off with. And Book Depository online sells them to us in Australia rather cheaply with no postage. The USA, you might have to go to Amazon or somewhere like that. You'll find the books. Now, when we were studying the previous chapters of the book of Revelation, we noticed in chapter 11, verse 1, that John, John himself, was given a measuring rod like a staff and was told, come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple, leave that out. Of course, the book of Revelation is full of symbolism. So John was not given a tape measure like the carpenters use and taken in the spirit to walk all around the temple and measure it. No such thing. The purpose of the measuring was to measure it according to its usefulness because it was coming to an end of any usefulness whatsoever in the economy of God. Temple worship before God had ceased. 
the minute Jesus Christ died on the cross and the, and the veil was rent in two from top to bottom by the hand of God supernaturally. And that curtain was some feet fit thick, not just a curtain of one piece of material. That was the end of temple worship. So now John is told a generation within the occurrence when it was torn, not quite the end of the generation, it's only about 35 years, not 40 yet, when he had this vision. So he measures the temple. And what's God saying? There's something wrong with the temple. Measure it as to its usefulness. And then don't measure outside because that's given over to the Gentiles for three and a half years. We can never overlook the fact that the book of Revelation ties up totally with the book of Daniel. Now, many a preacher says that, I've heard it, but they tie it up incorrectly. <laughs> you know why? Because they don't understand the meaning of, he, of Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27. They totally misconceive a doctrine that is out of focus with the whole of the book of Daniel and the whole of the Word of God, actually. And that comes from John Nelson Darby. Because I learnt it when I was a teenager. So then John begins to realise there's some terrible things going to be happening. I'm going to have two witnesses, said the Lord, wearing sackcloth. Now, sackcloth and ashes in the Old Testament days meant somebody was in humiliation and repentance and weeping and wailing for sin. And so these two witnesses in chapter 11, who are not two people, they're not Moses and Elijah come back to earth. They are two classes of ministry that goes back to Zechariah 4, and the classes are priest and king. Now you find the answer to that in Revelation chapter 1, because what is John told, and what is, does he say in chapter 1? He says in verse 5 and 6, from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now all kings think they're ruling. Well, they're ruling in a measure, and they're ruling generally through demonic power. But overall, Jesus Christ is their king. And they do his will many a time. And his will is not always good for them. Bad. But then it says in the next verse, he has made us a kingdom of priests. And in some of the Greek uh, translations it says he has made us kings and priests. The very fact we're in the kingdom, we're as kings with power to rule. And the power to rule is not over the nations of this world. Now, the power to rule could occur in this life. I remember in the early days of the outpouring of the Spirit, reading a story of somebody who in vision went through the different cities of the world praying in the Holy Ghost that they might have the outpourings of the Holy Ghost. Now, that person, whoever he or she was, was ruling. Ruling in the supernatural world. And we rule in the supernatural realm when we walk in the spirit of Christ and, and lead people into the kingdom of God. We're ruling. We're not ruling over the person. We're exercising our right as kings in the kingdom of God because that person is coming into the kingdom of God. 
And if we get people baptized in the Holy Ghost, which I always have loved to do, all these years, going back, well, 50 years, to see crowds filled with the Holy Ghost, worshipping in other tongues. Because we always led them into worship afterwards. And they, you would see the light of heaven on their faces. And you would hear the glorious praise welling up from their throats as they were filled with the Holy Ghost. I can't think of anything more wonderful to see on earth than that. And I have seen the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf heal. I'd rather see them all filled with the Holy Ghost. And of course we like to see people healed. We don't like to see sick people. But being filled with the Holy Ghost is far more important. So we are kings and priests to our God. And these two witnesses were, were in the form of the kingly anointing and the priestly anointing. And they wore sackcloth. It was not a message of reconciliation. It was a message of judgment. Because they had authority to shut up the sky and so forth. You read it in that chapter. Now that doesn't mean to say they said, stop raining. You know, we've been in a meeting in India. We had it outdoors and re rain was threatening and we all prayed, the people prayed, and the rain stopped. And as a matter of fact, we went all around that district from place to place, and it was raining everywhere, and we had every meeting without rain. And some of the pastors remarked on it and said, wherever you've gone, it just hasn't rained. Well, we didn't do anything about that. That was just the hand of God. Well, these two forms of witness were from the Church of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. I mean, the city is Jerusalem. So they're preaching in Jerusalem. Of course they're preaching. They're witnessing. They prophesy. Who knows what they said? We're not told. But they knew judgment was coming to Jerusalem because Jesus had said. And James, the brother of Jesus, who was not one of the disciples, he knew all about it. Of course he did. He didn't hear about it from Jesus while Jesus was uh, still ministering in, in, in Judea because he had nothing to do with Christ then. Afterwards, he repented and found Christ as the story goes. So these two witnesses are there and so forth. And then we went through that. Now we need to understand that John had received a book in the end of chapter 10, a scroll. And let's get this picture. It was honey in his mouth. He loved to receive this scroll from the Spirit. But when he swallowed it, it was bitter because the contents were terrible. If you're a real servant of the Lord, it's not always that you have to preach an encouraging, a faithful healing gospel message. There comes times in your life, maybe late in life, when you're preaching something that's bringing tragedy about something that's causing tragedies and causing death and destruction in the church of Jesus Christ in a spiritual manner. And it becomes bitter. So what John experienced was Everything else he's going to say for the rest of the book is still going to be full of judgments. The book of Revelation is about the judgment was about to fall on first Jerusalem and Judea and so forth, Palestine, and then on Rome, the Caesars and the Roman Empire. First about the judgment that was going to come upon the temple. Finished. Destroyed forever. No temple ever to be rebuilt. Now there was a temple rebuilt, but not under the hand of God. Man does many of things that they think is the will of God and it's not the will of God at all. So perverse can mankind be, and that includes us. 
if we don't watch out. And I'm sure all of us have been perverse at some stage of our lives. We need to recognize perverseness for what it is, a terrible sin from the pit of hell. And then we came in chapter 11 to the seventh trumpet. The seventh angel blew his trumpet. And this is a glorious message that he pronounced in verse 15. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Because the city fell in the previous chapter. There was an earthquake as these servants of the Lord went, departed out of Jerusalem, as it turns out, to Pella and other areas around those districts. Because the kingdom of Israel naturally finished. Never again would there be a kingdom of Israel on this earth and there is not one here today. There never will be one. There never will be a restored Israel that existed in the Old Testament. People are, changing, are chasing rainbows that don't exist when they follow that belief, which millions do. Little do they realize the present Jews in Palestine are Khazars. They're not even Jews. They're not even descendants of Abraham. They don't even follow the Old Testament. They follow the rabbis and the Kabbalah and the Talmud. You should download the Kabbalah and see how putrid and idolatrous and at enmity with God that it is. Full of Satanism. And those Christians all around the world who are in bed with the Jews in Israel, God help them. Because I need, I think they need his help to get out of the mess they're in to believe such an evil. So that kingdom finished. Now has come the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Not Messiah. He's the Christ. It's not Messiah in the Greek and it's not Messiah translated from the Greek. It's the Christ. The Messiah is the Hebrew word which is what it was in the original Hebrew way back in the days of David, for instance. I don't know. And probably nobody does. But nevertheless, it's Jesus Christ and he will reign forever and ever. Now we need to understand in chapter 11 that verse 8 identifies the city, Jerusalem, where our Lord was crucified. So where our Lord was crucified is about to undergo further judgment. It already was having some, being part of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was already having judgments. The Hebrews were having judgments. The Church of Jesus Christ was, not under, was under judgment. Because Peter says, and this really struck me a while back as it sank into my heart, Peter says, in relation to the tribulations and the persecution that the people to whom he was addressing his letters were existing, he said, for judgment must first begin at the house of God. He was talking about persecution. Judgment begins at the house of God, judging who will stand and who will fall. And that judgment is in the church of Jesus Christ today. Who will stand? Who will fall? We should be shaking in our boots in case we fall. Because people are going to fall. Matthew 25 gives the story of the parable of the ten virgins. Five had oil in their lamp, they were Christians. Five did not have oil in their lamp, they were Christians. Now whatever that means, it has something to do with the Holy Ghost. It has something to do with being filled with the Spirit and you can't be filled with the Spirit if you're not filled with the Word of the Gospel. So this concerns 
Jerusalem. And the judgment is going to come. And actually, the final judgment comes at the end of the three and a half years that relates to Daniel chapter 12. And the Gentiles are treading outside the temple area for three and a half years, which they did. The Romans of some sort. And actually, there were Edomites there and others who were the Gentiles. An Edomite is not a Jew. An Edomite has nothing to do with the seed of Abraham as promised in relation to the tribes of Israel. An Edomite is outside, never was in, except they came in under John Hyrcanus when he brought them all in and they, uh, they uh, took on Judaism, which is not the religion of the Old Testament. Those were the people who were around in the days of Jesus, preaching oral tradition instead of the word of God. So, within the city were two witnesses, and the city was no longer a holy city. It was full of putrefaction and wounds and bruises, as described in Isaiah chapter 1. It is said to be Sodom and Gomorrah. Why was it Sodom and Gomorrah? Because they were into homosexuality. They worshipped sex. They probably had their iron soft god. I'm not sure what they had. That's what they worship today. The Jews in Palestine. And you find out all about it from the, Bab uh, from the Kabbalah and other places like that. The whole of Palestine was uh, Israel. In fact, it's extended up towards Lebanon, and much more than the uh, Jews, Israel, has today. See, that's why they say they want Gaza. Well, they're getting it. They'd probably people it with, I don't know who. So now let us turn to Revelation 14, with that picture, as described, behind, in our minds. And in Revelations 14, which we have done before, they're on Mount Sion. The seventh trumpet has sounded. The kingdoms of this world, the kingdom of old Israel, has now been transformed into the kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ that is an everlasting, eternal, supernatural kingdom, not of this world, as Jesus said to Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. Never was, never is, never will be. He will never have a kingdom in Israel of this world. He will never have a kingdom there at all. His kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. And who is the Son? The Lord Jesus Christ. His Christ. Who is his Son? God's beloved, God's elect, God's righteous one. The son of man is so mentioned often as in one Enoch and in the ascension of Isaiah. Now there is no Israel before God. Once the temple falls, no natural nation of Israel forever. There is a nation of Israel today, but it was not put there by God as his. Now I dare not say it's not put there by God. I don't know what God's doing, neither do you. We only know what he's doing according to the clarity that comes to us from the word of God. And we know that he has not put Israel there to be his people at all, to be his nation. But he has allowed it, that's all you can say. So judgment has come, is to be coming upon Jerusalem, and she falls. Now that happened, as we re read in chapter 14, where it says in verse 8, 
Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This is talking about Israel. Because the Lamb and the 144,000 who, who consist of a multitude have come down to Mount Sinai in the Spirit. Now, don't, do you, don't you think that when a believer dies and in spirit he goes to heaven that he's just crouching in the corner? He's not just sitting in one place for uh, two, three thousand years till the Lord comes? He's active. If you read the book of 1 Enoch, you'll see all the activity that goes on in that supernatural realm that we should know about. But it, the impact of it hasn't struck us quite often. Well, it didn't strike me, but I knew all about it. <laughs> it didn't strike me as it has since I read 1 Enoch. It's continuous. Oh, well, we were told it was in Ephesians chapter 2. We were told it was throughout the, the New Testament, but somehow or other the impact of it is necessary to be received through the book of 1 Enoch and the book of the Ascension of Elijah, of Isaiah, sorry, and uh, also the book of Jubilees and so forth, which are missing from our Bibles. So she did fall in AD 70, finished forever. She was a Babylon, and it says, that we dealt with last time, says so in the Old Testament. She was a Babylon. Now later on there's another Babylon in chapter 16 and 17, and that Babylon is Rome. So there are two Babylons. Now most preachers, we all miss that. That's the only thing that makes sense when you read the book of Revelation. Look, the things of God have to make sense. Not a natural sense, but a spiritual sense. See, God said in Isaiah, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Reason together. So that's it. You have to reason with God. You have to reason with the Word. You don't reason with your own reasoning. Your own reasoning comes into the picture because we have the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ seeps into our powers of reasoning and conception. Through the voice of the Spirit of God, as he comes to us from the Word of God, but we have to have that. Or we get the wrong picture, which most of us have had. We haven't realized there are two Babylons. There were two Babylons in the Old Testament. Babylon, that was the city of Babylon, referred. And then there was Jerusalem, that Babylon was spoken of, that we have dealt with, as mentioned in I think it was Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, Isaiah, and so forth. Now, when we read uh, the Gospels, it comes to our minds the scenes we read, which is on an earthly base, an earthly city, an earthly country. Jesus is on earth, doing earthly things. And most people prefer to stay there, watching Jesus do normal miracles on earth. They fail to realize that it says in John chapter 3 verse 14 that he says the Son of Man keeps on ascending and descending to the Father. While he was here on earth in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ his divinity was still intact. As God he could be everywhere even as he saw the 70 when he sent them out and they cast out devils and they said, we, uh, he said, oh, they came back and said, we cast out devils in Luke 10. And Jesus said, yes, I know, I was there. I saw Satan falling from heaven. He saw Satan being cast out of the persons. He was there. And as deity, According to John 3.14, he keeps on ascending to his Father. 
No wonder he could say, I and my father are one. Now that's beyond our natural conception. We just have to accept what the Word of God says. We've got a great God. We just haven't got somebody who's like us. He's nothing like us. He's not, hu not human. He's divine. Even Jesus. We used to sing a song, it came to me, and I haven't sung it since I was a child, I don't think. I love him because he is mine. I love him because he is divine. I love him. He died on the tree, the Saviour of Galilee. That's who we love. Not just the Jesus who walked around the earth. We love him because he's divine. First and foremost, because he's divine. We, should, we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind. So we love him who is divine. And then we love him because as di being divine he came down to earth in his deity and he took unto himself humanity. And he is now God and man. The man Christ Jesus in the glory. Our intercessor between God and man. Not Mary. The Lord Jesus Christ. As we look at Matthew 21, 43, Jesus is speaking to the chief priests and elders of the people. And he says in verse 43, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone, Jesus Christ, will be broken to pieces. So here Jesus has told them on earth, the kingdom is going to be taken away from you people. Israel, you're not going to be the, uh, the kingdom anymore. You will not be the kingdom that God looks after. You will not be the people of God. You will not be restored. Taken away means it's taken away. He never said you'd get it back. It's taken away, that's it. It's given to another people. Who are the other people? The believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of the old nation of Israel, you've got the new nation of the Israel of God according to Galatians 6.16. Now people will say that's replacement theology. Well the funny thing about it is the man who originated the idea of replacement theology was John Nelson, John Nelson Darby and he said indeed there is replacement the theology and you're all following his doctrines except that one. You have to bring that in. It is replacement. The remnant only of old Israel get into the kingdom of God and of heaven. Only the remnant of old Israel throughout the centuries get in to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus wept over the city in Luke 19, 41 to 44. Now in verses 41, he, ver he weeps over Jerusalem. He said, terrible days are coming. Your enemies will set up rampants around you. Your children will be affected. They will not leave you one stone upon another in the city because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. The time of their visitation was the visitation from the angel of the covenant. Malachi 3 verse 1. Behold, I send the messenger of the covenant, the angel of the covenant. I will come quickly to my temple, says God. I will send the angel of the covenant. A visitation from God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Luke 20, he gave the parable of the tenants. And he said, it's going to be taken from you. You miss out. So Israel missed out. Totally. No more Israel. Totally. 
Israel missed out. Let's understand it. This is the Word of God. Don't look at what's going on around the world. Look at the Word of God. Don't listen to all those prophets that are around the churches of America prophesying folly. Don't listen to those preachers who've gone away from the Word of God and telling you that the tribulation's about upon you, whether you believe it happens before, in the middle or afterwards, that everything's going to end, terrible tribulation, it's within sight, the Lord's coming, we know he's coming, because, yeah, we can tell, because the tribulation will come. Let's have the tribulation. Let's have the wars. That's their attitude. Now, I want to tell you, Humanity has, has had nothing but tribulation and wars throughout its entire history. If a nuclear war comes, it'll be the worst war humanity has ever had. And you know who's trying to get us into this war? Yes, the rulers of USA. You know who they are. And their allies, the British. I'm a Britisher. Most of you probably descend from the British. A lot of you. It's got nothing to do with our nationality. It's to do with the purposes of God. It's to do with his word and his will. We cannot get away from Daniel 2 and the vision of the, or the dream of the image. The gold, Babylon, the Medes and Persians, the Greeks, and Rome. Rome is now the empire of the world, with great power, with all the evils of all the th uh, three prior uh, empires. It will fall. 